In this game, the future world champion Robert Fischer gives a masterclass in effective mobilization of all pieces and creative attack. First, his central pawn crosses the center of the board and cramps the enemy pieces. Then he transfers all minor pieces to the king side, exerting a tremendous pressure on the enemy king. And finally, he sacrifices a piece in order to open the h-file, after which his rooks join the attack. As a result, all his pieces take part in the attack and checkmate the enemy king. White starts with c4, but very soon the game transposes into the king's Indian defense, as Fischer opts for his favorite king's Indian defense. g6, knight c3, bishop g7, g3, e5, bishop g2, d6, e3, knight f6, knight e2, castles, castles, and Fischer plays c6, restricting White's light squared bishop and taking under control the important squares. White plays d4. Now, of course, it doesn't make sense for black to exchange change on d4, because in this case white's dark squared bishop, which is currently restricted by its own pawn, will be liberated and will become very active. That's why Fischer plays rook e8, preparing the advance of his e-pawn. In case his pawn crosses the center and stands on e4, it will restrict the light squared bishop and also, as it will blockade the e3 pawn, it will also restrict the dark squared bishop. That's why it would make sense for white to prevent this. In case white captures, of course, he doesn't get any advantage. After the possible exchange of the queens, the position would be absolutely equal. But white could have played queen c2, for example, taking under control the e4 square. Or maybe even immediate e4 was possible also opening his dark squared bishop's diagonal. But instead of this, white played rook b1, which was a slight inaccuracy, because it lets the pawn cross the center of the board, and now, as Fischer writes in his annotations, this pawn cramps white's whole game. The only way to get rid of this annoying pawn is to play f3, but in this case black will exchange on f3, after which the e3 pawn will become weak. The idea of rook b1, however, is obvious. White is going to start the counterplay on the queen side, trying to f open the files and, after that, invade black's queen side with his pieces, while black's plan is, of course, to initiate the attack on the king side. So, white starts his counterplay, b4, and now Fischer starts his fantastic mobilization. He will transfer his queen's pieces, one by one, from the queen side to the king side. First, he starts, he starts with the bishop, bishop f5, defending his most important pawn one more time, and also, later in the game, he will create the queen and bishop battery. And this battery will operate very effectively on this diagonal, and the black bishop might invade h3, which might lead to the exchange of the light squared bishops, after which the light squares on uh, white's king side will be weak. White plays h3, taking under control the g4 square, preventing the black pieces from um, invading this square, and also preparing the possible g4, uh, kicking out the bishop from f5. But Fischer makes a very strong move, h5, preventing white from playing g4 once and for all. Besides that, later in the game he might play h4, which would lead to the weakness of the uh, weakening of the king side. And also another idea behind h5, which is very important, is to vacate the h7 square for the queen's knight, which will be rerouted to g5 via h7 and on g5 the knight will take part in the attack of the king side attacking f3 and h3 as the black pawn has left the e5 square and stopped controlling the f4 square the knight occupies this square and becomes very active and takes part in the defense of the king side and fisher starts his knight maneuver knight d7 the knight is heading to g5 and white continues his counterplay on the queen side a4 knight f8 and here white makes another mistake instead of b5 which was recommended by fisher white plays c5 but this move lets black close the center after which white's counterplay on the queen side will be very slow. White needs a lot of tempi in order to open files on the queen side. And as the game will show, white doesn't have all this time, because black's attack on the king side is very 
uh, energetic and dangerous. So white plays b5 and knight h7 followed. Bishop d2 developing the bishop and knight g5 creating an immediate threat, namely knight f3 check. For example, in case white continues his uh, counterplay on the queen side and plays a5, knight f3 check would follow, and after the exchange, it turns out that the bishop's diagonal opens and the rook is under attack. And in case white saves his rook, he loses his knight. After g5, it turns out that the knight doesn't have a single square to retreat. That's why after knight g5, white plays rook b2, moving the rook away from the bishop's diagonal. And now, of course, knight f3 check doesn't make uh, much sense. But Fischer makes a much stronger move, of course. Queen d7. Now the queen joins the attack. Attacking the h3 pawn for the third time, while it's defended only twice. So white must do something about it. In case white plays h4, which would be a mistake, of course, because it would weaken the g4 square, the bishop would immediately invade this square with a tempo, attacking the queen. And after the queen moves, of course, both the bishop and the knight control the f3 square, and the knight, of course, would invade uh, with great effect. So that would be really unpleasant for white. That's why, instead of h4, of course, white plays king h2, defending his pawn with the king. Now, Fischer plays bishop h6. His dark squared bishop uh, isn't taking part in the attack, but it can be exchanged for white's main defensive piece, the knight. White continues his counterplay, a5, and we have reached the critical position. It seems that uh, Black has finished his mobilization. All he, almost all his pieces are attacking White's kingside. But it seems that White has defended all his uh, weaknesses. And White is ready to continue his counterplay, open files, and that might be really dangerous. So... Black must do something, but uh, it isn't clear how Black can increase the pressure on the king side and continue his attack. Fischer writes in his annotations that he uh, considered three options during the game. The first one was h4, the second one was knight f3 check, which also gave him a slight advantage. He gives the following variation, bishop takes f3, e takes f, Queen takes f3, then uh, black exchanges the main defender of the king side. After that, the knight, uh, of course, which uh, defended the h3 pawn, uh, isn't defending it anymore, and the h3 is under attack, so white captures with the g pawn, defending his pawn. And after that, black captures on b5, and black's position is slightly better because white cannot capture on b5. After that, black would play bishop d3 with the double attack, attacking the rook and the knight, and white is losing the exchange. White must play rook b1, after which, of course, black captures on b1. That was the second option. And now we come to the third option, which was much more interesting and creative. You can pause the video and try to find it. I will give you just a small tip. What black pieces aren't taking part in the attack at the moment, and how to bring them into the attack? So, the pieces, of course, are the rooks, and Fischer finds a very creative way to bring them into the attack by sacrificing the bishop. Bishop g4, putting the bishop right under the attack of the pawn and attacking the queen. He writes in his annotations that white is almost forced to accept the sacrifice. In case he doesn't and plays queen b3, Fischer gives the following variation. Of course, now both the bishop and the knight control the f3 square and the knight invades with check. And after bishop takes, bishop takes, of course, the light squares are terribly weakened. White doesn't have the light squared bishop anymore to defend them, while the black bishop is greatly placed and white's position is critical. White can, of course, capture on b6 and even invade the queen side. But, of course, black avoids the exchange of the queens. He needs the, his queen for the attack, um, leaving the c6 pawn unguarded, but it doesn't matter. After queen takes c6, black eliminate again the main defender of the king side, and after g takes uh, f, Fischer gives knight g4 check. Of course, white cannot capture. In this case, the queen takes g4. There is no defense against uh, the checkmate. Neither can the king move to g1. In this case, knight e5 would follow with the double attack, attacking the queen and the h3 pawn. 
And after black captures on h3, of course, checkmate on g2 would follow. That's why after knight g4 check, the king must move to g3. But in this case, h4 check, king takes h4, then king g7, threatening deadly rook h8 check. White can capture on d5, hoping to exchange the queens, but of course, rook h8 check, king g3, and then black sacrifices the rook on h3, luring the white king to h3, and then with the discovered check, the knight stands right between the queens, preventing the exchange of the queens with the discovered check, which leads to uh, checkmate in a couple of moves. So that's why uh, white was almost forced to accept the sacrifice. H takes G followed. And now we can see the idea behind this sacrifice. After H takes G, the H file opens and black will play king G7, after which his rooks will join the attack on the white king on the H file. Besides that, the black pawn has moved from H5 to G4. And now both the G pawn and the F pawn control the F3 square. That means after black plays knight F3 check, white will have to capture of course black will capture with the g pawn and the pawn on f3 will be protected by the e pawn and this pawn on f3 will be very strong it will be as strong as a piece it will completely paralyze white's position and restrict uh, white's position and besides that after the pawn moves from g4 to f3 the queen's diagonal will open and it will move to h3 creating checkmating threats on g2 together with the f3 pawn. So, oh, black's threats are simply terrifying. White must do something. But what can white do? Fisher writes that in case white plays bishop h1 with the idea of vacating the g2 square for the king so that the king escapes to the queen side, it doesn't work. Black would simply check on f3 and after king g2, black eliminates the knight one more time and after e takes f, Queen f5 follows with a deadly threat, queen h5, queen h3 checkmate, so white must play rook g1, hoping to escape to the queen side, but in this case, again, queen h5, king f1, and queen h2, attacking the rook, and there is no defense, white must capture on f3, but in this case, e takes f, opening the e file, and cutting the white king on the e-file, now he cannot escape, and black is threatening deadly queen h3 check. The only move would be rook g2, and after that queen takes g2, checkmate would follow. And there is nothing white can do. White can only play bishop e3, uh, cl closing the e-file, but it doesn't work because of the sacrifice after which black captures the rook, and white's position is absolutely hopeless. So, in our game, instead of bishop uh, h1, which looks a little bit unnatural, white made a more natural move. Rook h1. Hoping to oppose the black rook on the h-file and also hoping to escape again to the queen side. Fischer plays knight f3 check. Now the only legal move is bishop takes f3. And, as you see, the pawn on f3 is great. So... White is up a piece, but it doesn't matter at all because black pawn is can be counted as a piece. Besides that, the white pieces on the queen side are absolutely useless. They are immobile. They cannot take part in the defense of the king side because the communication between the queen side and the king side is broken. The pawns completely paralyze white's position and white pieces cannot be rerouted to the king side to help it. Neither can these pieces take part in the counterplay on the queen side because white's counterplay is too slow. White is late. The uh, files on the queen side aren't opened yet and white doesn't have time to open these files. So... White, black is threatening to play king g7, rook h8. That's the deadly threat. That's why white tries to uh, escape. King g1 follows. Attacking the bishop, of course. This bishop doesn't take part in the attack, but it eliminates white's main defender of the king side. Bishop takes f4. Of course, black, white cannot capture with the g pawn. In this case, black checkmates the white king on the spot. That's why uh, white captures with the e pawn. Now, of course, it's time to bring the rooks into the attack. King g7. So, Fisher's plan is simple. Rook h8, exchange the rooks, 
invade h3 and checkmate on g2. In case white continues his counterplay, that's exactly what's going to happen. Rook h8, the exchange of the rooks. White can play queen f1, of course, preventing the black queen from invading h3, but the queen invades g4, followed by queen h5 and checkmate on h1, and there is nothing white can do about it. But white found a very interesting resource, f5, opening the bishop's diagonal and placing his pawn between the black queen and the h3 square. So, closing uh, queen's diagonal. So, now it will take more time for black to uh, continue his attack, to create deadly threats. So, Fischer play. of course, now it would be a mistake to capture this pawn. That would be a terrible blunder because of simple bishop h6 check and the black rooks won't be able to operate on the h-file. Of course, Fischer didn't make this mistake. He made the strongest move, rook h8. And now, again, black is threatening to capture to exchange and invade h3 that's why white made a desperate attempt to save the game by sacrificing the piece by returning the sacrifice bishop h6 check black captures and after the exchange of the rooks the black king stands on the h file right in front of his rook after it moves to h8 so again White is too late with his uh, counterplay. In case a6, black would simply capture on f5 and after a takes b, rook h8. White can even capture on b6. Now his rook supports the pawn and he's threatening to promote to queen, but black simply ignores it. King g7 and after white promotes to queen, the rook sacrifice might follow. Fischer gives this beautiful variation in his annotations in order to uh, lure the king to h1 so that queen h3 comes with tempo, check, and checkmate. That's why instead of a6, white plays queen d2 check, but now simply g5 follows. b takes c, attacking the queen and the pawn, but Fischer ignores white's counterplay on the queen side because he's going to checkmate the white king. Queen takes f5. Threatening, of course, queen h3. White cannot uh, capture on b7 because after queen h3 there is no defense against the checkmate. But white plays knight d1. And after queen h3, black is threatening checkmate, but, but knight e3, defending the g2 square. But there is no way white can defend the h1 square. That's why Fischer plays, of course, king g6 and now his last piece which wasn't doing anything during the game comes into play with great effect after rook h8 there will be no defense against the checkmate on h1 and that's why white resigned and now i recommend watching a game in which fischer exerted tremendous pressure on victor karchnoy's king side and carried out a brilliant knight maneuver which resulted in a checkmating attack but first like this video and subscribe as it's really helpful for the channel growth